All right, today we're going to continue on with section 2.1 and 2.2, and we're going to continue to look at uh, polynomials. So first, I want you to try and find a polynomial function that has the given zeros, x equals 0, x equals 2, and x equals 5. So pause the video and come up with an answer. Uh, there are many correct answers. And when you got one, then unpause, and we'll check. Okay, so the really key thing to understand here is that if x equals 0 is a 0, then x is a factor. If x minus 2 is a 0, I'm sorry, if x equals 2 is a 0, then x minus 2 is a factor. And if x equals 5 is a 0, then x minus 5 is a factor. Now, these are the simplest forms of each one of these factors. Um, for instance, if I want to make this more complicated, I can put any degree here I want on this x factor. This could be x to the fifth, and it still meets this requirement. Same with this factor, x minus 2. This could be x minus 2 to the 7th, and it still meets this requirement. And same with the x minus 5. So the simplest form of the function with these requirements for zeros would be f of x equals x times the quantity x minus 2 times the quantity x minus 5. If I multiply this all out, I end up with f of x equals x cubed minus 7x squared plus 10x. Now again, I could have made this more difficult for myself if I wanted to by putting... Uh, a higher exponents than just one on any one of these factors. Okay, so now we're going to do a little exploration. So I've provided these tables here. So I want you to look at these tables. Um, and in each table, take a minute and try to figure out where do zeros occur. Now we don't know the exact value necessarily, but in what interval of x values does a zero has to have to occur? So again, pause the video, take a minute and figure that out. And then once you have that, then once you have what you think is correct, unpause and we'll go through. Okay, so hopefully you recognize that if I look at whatever this function is over here, I don't know what the actual equation is for the function, but I see that as x goes from negative four to negative three, the y value went from negative 76.62 to positive 5.58. Therefore, if this is a function, which I'm telling you it is, so you gotta trust me on that one, um, that I know I had to cross the x-axis between those two values. So on the interval negative four to negative three, there has to be a zero. I don't know exactly where it is in between there, but I know that there has to be one in between there. Uh, same thing happens down here. So as x goes from 0 to 1, the y values go from positive to negative. Therefore, between 0 and 1, another uh, 0 had to occur. Uh, down here, as x goes from positive 3 to positive 4, the y values go from negative to positive again. So therefore, between x of 3 and 4, I know that there has to be a 0 there. Over here on this function, I can see between negative 7 and negative 6, I go from positive to negative, and so therefore I know that there's a zero in there. And as I go from one to two, uh, in the x direction I go negative two to positive six in the y's. So again, I have to cross the x-axis. So I know that there has to be a zero within that. And being able to recognize that is very important. It leads us um, to a very useful theorem that's used a lot in calculus, but also very helpful in algebra when we're dealing with polynomials and other functions. And so that theorem is called the intermediate value theorem. So what does the intermediate value theorem say? Well, the intermediate value theorem says that uh, if f is continuous, on the closed interval a to b, any number between 
f of a and f of b then I know there is at least one number C in the interval A to A to B such that f of c equals k. Okay, so let's talk about what exactly does this mean, because that's very formal. Um, so f is our function. It's continuous between two x values a and b. Um, so again, if I look back here, like for instance, if I, I'm assuming this is continuous, and I'm going to say a is negative 4 and b is negative 3. So uh, k is any number between f of a and f of b. Well, so if I look back here, f of a would be negative 76, f of b would be 5.58 approximately. Then there is at least one number c in that interval a and b such that f of c equals k. So if I want k to be 0, I know that it has to exist because of this property at some c value. The key here though is I don't necessarily know that c value, I just know that it has to exist. So that's what the intermediate value theorem is telling us. Okay, so now let's go back to um, finding polynomials. So here, pause the video, find a polynomial function that has the given zeros for 2 plus root 7 and 2 minus root 7. When you got an answer, unpause it. Okay, so similar to the problem we did before, I know if uh, 4 is a 0, then that means x equals 4, which tells me x minus 4 is a factor. If 2 plus root 7 is a 0, then x minus 2 minus root 7 is a 0. And if 2 minus root 7 is a 0, then x minus 2 plus root 7 is a 0. I'm sorry, is a factor. These are my factors, I apologize. Um, so I can rewrite this now as a polynomial f of x equals the quantity x minus 4 times the quantity x minus 2 minus root 7 times the quantity x minus 2 plus root 7. Uh, if you're going to multiply this out, multiply out the roots together first. Uh, it'll make it a lot nicer for you. Um, so first I multiply this together and I treat it kind of like the difference of squares. These both have an x minus 2, so that's x minus 2 squared. And uh, negative root 7 and positive root 7 becomes minus 7. Multiply this out and combine it with the negative 7, and this quantity here becomes x squared minus 4x minus 3, still times x minus 4. So now I have to continue with my distributor property, uh, multiply this out, combine like terms, and I end up with f of x equals x cubed minus 8x squared plus 13x plus 12. So this is one correct answer. Again, it's the simplest correct answer. Uh, I could have made this more difficult for myself, but still correct by putting an exponent on any one of these factors or multiple of those factors. Uh, for instance, I could have made this x minus 4 to the seventh power, and then this is going to be a lot more difficult to multiply out, but it would still be correct. Okay, so if we look at another example, here we want to find a polynomial with the given zeros and multiplicities and degree. Um, so multiplicity, that is just how often does the zero occur. Uh, here, to save time, we're not going to multiply this out. So um, find, the poly find a polynomial with these restrictions, but leave it in factored form. So pause the video, do that, and unpause it when you're ready to check. Okay, so here I have a degree of 0 with a multiplicity of 2. I'm sorry, a 0 of 0 with a multiplicity of 2, so that gives me x squared, and a 0 of 5 with a multiplicity of 3, so I have the quantity x minus 5 cubed. Together, 2 plus 3 gives me a total degree for the polynomial of 5. Okay, now let's try another one. Sketch the graph of a polynomial function that has the given conditions. It's a fourth degree polynomial with three real zeros and a negative leading coefficient. 
So pause the video, do that, and then pause it when you're ready to check your answer. Again, there are multiple correct answers. Okay, so here are two examples that I came up with. Again, there are other correct things. Uh, but basically, if it's a fourth degree polynomial and it has a negative leading coefficient, the end behavior needs to be down left, down right. Uh, so that's my end behavior. And if it has three real zeros, I'm going to cross the x-axis twice and then I'm going to just touch it and then bounce back at some other point. Um, so that has to occur in this situation. Uh, again, yours might look slightly different as long as it meets those requirements and has the correct uh, end behavior. Okay, last example. So an open box is to be made from a square piece of material 36 centimeters on a side by cutting equal squares from sides of length x from the corners and turning up the sides. Find an equation for the volume of the box. What is the domain of the volume function? What value of x will provide the maximum volume? And what is that volume? All right, so I want you to take a minute, pause the video, and um, try to solve this problem. And then come back when you're done, and we'll check your answer. Okay, so I want to draw a picture, and this is what my picture should look like. I have a square piece of material, 36 by 36. I know that I'm cutting out an x by x square from each corner. So now, if I fold up these sides, the bottom of my box is going to be 36 minus 2x times, or by 36 minus 2x. So the volume, which is length times width times height, is 36 minus 2x times 36 minus 2x times x, which is now the height of the box. Or I can rewrite it a little bit nicer, x times 36 minus 2x quantity squared. What is the domain of the volume? Well, the domain of this function is all real numbers, but the domain of the volume is going to be 0 to 18, not including 0 and not including 18. And I'm getting that because in order to have height, I need x to be greater than 0. And in order to meet the requirement of 36 um, centimeters on each side, I know that the most x could be is 18, but not including 18, or it has to be less than 18. Okay, so now, how do I find the max? Well, uh, we don't know calculus yet, so we're not going to use calculus. So we're actually going to use the calculator here. Um, so go ahead and put the volume equation into your calculator. So I'm going to pause the video while I do that. Okay, so I put the function in. Now here, I know kind of some stuff about this function. It's a cubic, but I don't care about most of it. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to set my window for x minimum to be 0, x maximum to be 18, uh, y minimum to be 0, and y maximum to be, uh, let's go with 36 squared. Um, I know that that's not necessarily the right answer, and actually in this case it's not going to be uh, but I know that it's going to be relatively large. That should be good enough to at least see what's going on. So now if I go to the graph, I can see that part that I want. So I know the maximum is somewhere way up here. Well, I don't actually need to find it because I'm going to use the calculator for that. I'm going to do second trace, and I'm going to do maximum. And for a left bound, I'm going to pick something over here. So let's do 1. For a right bound, I'm going to pick something over here. So let's do 17. Enter gas doesn't matter. And so I get my maximum occurs when x is 6 and y is 3,456. So if I write that in a sentence now, x equals 6 centimeters provides a max volume of 3,456 centimeters cubed. And that's all we have for this lesson.